dedicated they are to the cause of Christ, and certainly we realize that there have been men in that congregation who have been dedicated and who have known what needed to be talked about. Well, whenever we stop to consider this man Joshua, we certainly realize that he was truly a man for his times. It's hard to imagine for you and for me this solemn assembly that was gathered before him on that day, but Joshua on this occasion had the ear of the people. They listened to what he had to say and for good cause. You see, Joshua was an old man by this time, and he was well stricken with years. And not only that, he was their God-appointed leader. You know, whenever we have church leaders in our congregations, we need to recognize that they are God-appointed. He has given the qualifications for being an elder, the qualifications for being a deacon. And whenever a man has worked hard all of his life to be able to meet those qualifications, he holds a special place in the eyes of the congregation and also in the eyes of God. And Joshua was just that way on this occasion. He had, a more, he had more and a better understanding about what these people had been through as a nation, as individuals. He understood their experiences, their trials, their times whenever they stood strong. He also knew the times whenever they were weak and whenever they weren't all that they should have been. He was greatly uh, knowledgeable of everything about these people. Well, whenever he stood before this great and noble assembly on that day, he had their honor and he had their respect. You see, he wasn't one like all of them who had been born in the wilderness. If you stop and think about the group of people that were standing before Joshua on this occasion, none of them had been the ones that marched out of Egypt whenever Moses and uh, Aaron led the tribe of Israel out of Egyptian bondage. You remember all of them, because of their unbelief, they had died, uh, all the ones that were over 20 years old, in the wilderness. And they had there uh, purged that generation of those that were unbelievers and those that were skeptics and those that uh, did not have the courage to do what God wanted them to do. But Joshua was there. He had marched out of Egypt with them, and he had endured every hardship they had endured, and he had also uh, been able to survive just as they had been able to survive. You know, he, Joshua, had seen, the, had seen the lack of resolve, the lack of commitment, and the lack of dedication and faith that these people's fathers and forefathers had demonstrated. Remember, shortly after they left the uh, land of Egypt and the Egyptian captivity, they cried out to Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us? Carry us uh, forth out of Egypt. Is it not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to have served the Egyptians then we should die in the wilderness. They didn't look to God uh, for the uh, needs and the necessities and for the uh, power and the protect protection that he would supply. Even though they had seen all of the Egyptian soldiers and Pharaoh perish in the closing of the sea about them, they still doubted and they were still very weak in their faith. You know, it seems that whenever we stopped to see these people, they were continuously complaining. They never could see things that suited them or things that they thought were well for them. Remember whenever God was feeding them uh, with the manna that fell from heaven? All you had to do every morning was go out and just pick up enough to do you all day. And then whenever you got finished in the evening, if you had left some left over, throw it out. And go out the next morning and it'd be fresh again. All but on the day before the Sabbath, whenever you picked up enough for two days. Well, that wasn't good enough for them. And you remember that they cried out, we loathe, we hate this light bread. So also in Exodus, the 16th chapter, God began to feed them with quail. And in the morning when they'd go out to pick up the manna, there would be quail wandering about that didn't run from them, didn't fly away. And you could go out and pick up as many as you thought you'd need that day. And you could have the assurance they'd be there again tomorrow. But that didn't, have, that didn't make them happy and it didn't satisfy them. They'd been present, or Joshua had been present on that evil day whenever, uh, because Moses was up on Mount Sinai, the children of Israel had gotten uh, afraid and they didn't uh, know what to do. And they cried out and asked uh, Aaron there to make them a golden calf that they could worship. And so whenever they did that, 
uh, whenever Moses uh, came back, or while he was up there, uh, they cried out, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Exodus 32 and 4. And you know, it'd be hard for me to imagine how a group of people could see the mighty hand of God deliver them from Egypt, Egyptian bondage and destroy the army behind them and uh, be so ignorant as to cry out, uh, These are the gods which saved thee. And so whenever we stop and see that uh, what a great experience that Joshua had had and how he had been there throughout all of it, it's amazing to us that uh, he was able to stand up and encourage the people uh, that he did. And so whenever we see this great day and whenever we see all that lies in the future of these people, who else could better make this uh, statement, make this speech, or if you prefer, prefer preach this sermon than Joshua himself? Well, I'll tell you, brothers and sisters in Christ, we have a great need today for men like Joshua, men who have experience, men who have the people in their best interest, men who have proved themselves through dedicated lives to the cause of Christ, who will lead us and guide us and help us not to make the mistakes that have been made so often in the church, been made so often in society. I'm not talking so much this evening about society. You know, everywhere that I go, whether it be to the gas station or whether it be to the grocery store or whether it be downtown to pick up something that I need or any other place that I go, I am constantly hearing about what a wicked and what a sorry world that we live in. And whenever I stop and hear people say those kind of things, I can't really deny it because all you have to do is pick up the uh, newspaper if you still get one or look on the news if you watch it on television or however you get your news, even if it's word of mouth. And all we ever hear about are things that are bad and things that we wish didn't happen and things that certainly we think are going to bring damnation to our country and to our world. But you know, on the other hand, I guess it's always been that way. I was reading some sermons uh, just this past week, and there was a certain sermon that I was reading, and there the author of that sermon uh, went through all of the list of the commodities that the United States owned. He said, we own more gold than any country in the world. We own more oil than any country in the world. We have more automobiles than any country in the world. We have a better food supply than any country in the world. Uh, not only that, uh, we have a greater army than any country of the world. And he named all of these things. And so whenever he got through that, the only thing different than what you or I would say today would be the percentages of those things that we own and are those things that are owned by our countrymen. But still, whenever he began to teach the sermon part of his lesson that I was reading, he talked about how wicked the world was, how morally corrupt the world was, and how it was beyond his farthest imagination uh, that this country could make it another 10 years. That'd be something that we'd hear if we went to town today, wouldn't it? That'd be something that would inevitably come up if we stood around and talked for very long. This sermon was 75 years old when I was reading, and so that just lets you know uh, that people have always looked upon the conditions of the world as being terrible. And whenever you look at the conditions of the world from our perspective, who are trying to live godly, holy lives, who are trying to rear our families in this wicked generation, certainly things at least appear worse, and I wouldn't argue one bit that they are worse. But my wife and I have let time get away from us. I still feel as young as I ever did. I still like the same things that I've always liked. I still dislike the same things that I've always disliked. I just can't go and do like I used to do. And so it struck me as I took the pulpit this evening and heard uh, these young brethren pray the prayers and lead the songs. Uh, they were just toddlers the last time I was here. And now they are approaching uh, manhood. They are uh, farther along than what we call adolescence. And so time rolls on and things change and the conditions of our environment change and the world changes. But the one thing that has to stay the same and the one thing that we want to stay the same is the church of Jesus Christ. We want to always have the gospel preached to us in a pure and simple way that we can understand and so that we will know what's being taught. And that's exactly what Joshua was doing on this occasion. I would to God that young men would rise up who had that desire in their lives. I don't know if you've noticed or if you've paid much attention to it, uh, but we can go to some of the bigger meetings in the Brotherhood today and see a very stark uh, challenge that lies before us. 
and that is to rear up and train and support and uh, encourage young preachers who, first off, have the ability to preach, and secondly, who want to preach, and thirdly, who are willing to make the sacrifices to preach. It's not an easy life. But you know what we're uh, getting a great supply of are young men who've never worked a job, young men who really have never studied the Bible, they talk to other people about it, and young men who really don't want to work, they like to carry on the uh, responsibilities of being a Sunday preacher, but they don't really care too much about Monday through Saturday. And that's something that there is a great dearth of in the land today, people who are ready, willing, and able to occupy the pulpit. I hope you'll join me in prayer that God would send workers into the harvest because it certainly is white and ready for the harvest. Well, to go on to the other parts of our lesson, that's exactly what Joshua was doing. And I want you to notice that the very first commitment that he made of the three commitments we're going to talk about is that Joshua made the personal commitment for himself to serve God in truth and in spirit without any turning from side to side. Have you made that decision today? Have you uh, decided uh, that you're going to follow Christ wherever he leads, whatever the Bible says? I know that the majority of the people here have, the ones that I've been introduced to and spoken to, not only this time, but on my other occasions I've been here. I noticed that you know, you're still here. And you're still fighting the good fight of faith. And so I hope that that is a commitment that everyone has made. But we have to make sure that we make that commitment and that we stick to it. You know, like I said, time gets away from me. And I really, when I stop and turn around and look and count up the years uh, that's passed, it amazes me. Uh, how much time has gone by. In fact, I was just talking to Angie before we left here uh, to come over uh, this uh, afternoon. How long is it now that I've been preaching? And she said, well, she keeps up with that stuff. She said, well, it's about 47 years. Well, how long have I been a Christian? She said, March will be 49 years. That's a lifetime to many people. And that has been my lifetime. But you know, I have never turned back. I've never thought about turning back. Whenever I made my decision to follow Christ, it was a permanent decision, and it was a decision that I was bound and determined to stick with no matter what happened in life. Have you made that commitment? I'm sure that you have, because whenever I look and I see the families that are here, and whenever I see the aged men that are here and the aged women, I know that you've made that commitment too. Well, that's what Joshua was encouraging these people to do. He said, as for me, as for me, I will serve the Lord. You know, Joshua had an opportunity to do much differently. I read in a college class, or some professor once said, that stuck with me, that the first generation of lawgivers that ever occupied those positions in a society uh, always have the people in mind. They uh, rule honestly, uh, they rule with self-sacrifice, uh, and they do so in such a way as to further the new country that's just been established. You think back on your history lessons, and you'll remember some of our uh, uh, nation's fathers and how that they conducted themselves. But uh, this file also said, by the second generation, <coughs> that'd be three or four leaders, three or four presidents by then, by the second generation, they've begun to uh, see the opportunities that are there for the leaders. And they have been tempted to take them, but most of them hadn't taken those opportunities yet. By the third generation of rulers, he said, uh, the people that run for office, that make a, a lifetime out of politics, the ones that always want to be in charge, do so because they have figured out a system where they can better themselves, where they can better their families, and where they can become wealthy, ruling over the people. Well, I want you to know that Joshua could have done all of those things, but he didn't. He could have ruled much differently than what he did. You know, it was left up to Joshua uh, to be the chief organizer, the head, if you would, of the secular government of the church. And whenever he did that, he could have set himself up as a prince. He could have set himself up as some perpetual leader that would never have to worry about stepping down. He would always be in authority. But that's not what he did. Uh, he made a commitment to serve the people and to see that their government was perpetuated in time. And that's the kind of men that we need. You know, in the church today, I'm afraid that on some occasions, some occasions, is all I'm saying, some occasions we've been held back well, by those who were not willing to step aside whenever their role was really fulfilled. 
They perhaps didn't feel like anybody had been prepared to take the leadership of the church. They didn't feel like there was anybody that wanted to take the leadership of the church, or maybe there just wasn't anybody that could do as good a job as they had done. But nevertheless, we must realize that our time comes and our time goes. And so we need to be prepared when our time comes. We need to serve to the very best of our ability with the people in mind. And then we need to train up others to come behind us that can take up the mantle of leadership and do so in a way that would please, first of all, God, and then be beneficial to the church. Well, he could have also set up the land whenever he uh, divided the land among the people. You know, it was up to Joshua how to divide it. And he could have made sure that uh, either secretly or even overtly that he had uh, made sure that his family got a little more than everybody else, uh, that his family was left a little better off than everybody else. That is, after all, the goal of every father, isn't it, to leave uh, things better for your children than they were for yourself so that they won't have to struggle as much as you perhaps had to struggle in this secular world that we live in? Don't you think that Joshua ever thought of those things? I'm sure that he did, but he realized that a true servant of God, a steward of God, was overseer of God's things, God's material world, and that he was to administer over that without selfishness, without favor, and without partiality. And we need men like Joshua today. We need men like Joshua in our government, but I'm not so concerned about that. We need men in the church like that, men that will be servants and good stewards of God. You know, I remind our congregation every opportunity that I have, and I'm sure that uh, those that do the predominant amount of the speaking here also uh, encourage you to be good stewards over God's heritage. Do you know what that really means? You know, I used to think and try to be a little philosophical. I never was too good at it. But what do you think or what do you count that is really yours? Something that you have total control over, something that you can determine what is done with it and have not have to uh, depend on anyone else. Well, yeah, I, I couldn't think of anything to start with. Certainly my money is not mine. God gives me the ability to get up every morning, breathe his fresh air. He kept my heart beating, and uh, he gave me the opportunity uh, to work with my hands, to provide for my responsibilities, just like he does you. And so the money that I earned, I couldn't say that was mine, that was God's. Well, what about my house? Now, I know most of us have someone else build our house, and we pay them for it, and that's fine and good, but I built my own uh, for the most part, uh, so I can say that's mine, and I own it. But no, God gave me the knowledge to do those kind of things, the ability to do those kind of things. I really couldn't claim it for mine. Well, I can say my health is mine, isn't it? Isn't my health mine? Isn't your health yours? Don't we go to great extremes and measures to make sure that our bodies are healthy? Uh, in fact, whenever I was going into the motel today, I saw a guy that was uh, trying to jog down the sidewalk, and I thought to myself, you know, that's what it took to live longer, I'm sure... Uh, wouldn't be looking forward to that you know, because it looked like he was killing him just jog down the road. But we do those kind of things because we want to live longer, right? But that doesn't secure your life. Why, your heart would stop beating before you ever move another muscle, before you ever think another thought. So we could go on and on. What is ours? What is ours? And whenever it gets down to it, there's very, very little. In fact, the only two things that I could come up with was number one, your soul. Your soul is yours. You don't have to do the things to save your soul. You don't have to live the kind of life to save your soul. You can bow up against God and live however you want to in this world. You can do that, and you don't really have to ask anybody for their permission. But you will have to answer for what you've done, but your soul is yours. You can do what you want to do with it. And then your opportunities. You know, you have opportunities every day. You have opportunities. Joshua had opportunities. I have opportunities. What do you mean by that? Well... There will be an opportunity that will come to me tomorrow. I don't know when it will be or where it will be or with whom it will be. But I'll have an opportunity to do something, something to further the cause of Christ. And I'll have, so, have an opportunity to do something uh, that will help along the way. Now, if I turn a deaf ear to that and I don't take that opportunity, it's gone. I won't get it again, not that exact same one. And I couldn't give it to you either. I couldn't get on the phone and say, hey, you know, I've got an opportunity down here to do good. And I decided I'm not going to do it. Well, how about you coming down here and taking care of that? I couldn't do that. It's not your opportunity. It was my opportunity. And we need to take sure, make sure that we take care of our opportunities so that we can take care of our souls. 
You know, whenever we see that there is a need for men uh, to be like Joshua and to be unselfish, to be committed, to be firm, to be strong, to be men, has there ever been a time whenever we needed uh, that more than we do today? And so I noticed that we have these young men in the congregation this evening. I want to encourage you, you know, men, to make that commitment in your life right now. Make that commitment while you still have uh, the choices to make that will determine how your life turns out. Make sure that you are committed to God and that you are full of prepared whenever your time comes. There's never a better time for you to study your Bible or because you have people you can ask if there are things that you don't understand. You can memorize scripture now. Your mind and your brain is able to do that. And now is the time for you to be prepared, and it will pay great dividends uh, in your uh, future life and your future service in the church. We need to have men, young men, old men, all men, and women that will read their Bible and let their Bible be their guide. To fear God and keep his commandments. You know, most men today don't have any idea what the Bible says. Uh, they don't read their Bible. They don't study their Bible. It's not something that they uh, invest a lot of time in. And the only thing that they know is what somebody else has told them about the Bible. And if that's the predicament you find yourself in, you need to be very careful because your soul is in jeopardy. Paul tells Timothy, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase into more ungodliness. 2 Timothy 2, uh, chapter 15 and six, or verse 15 and 16. You know, many people today uh, cannot even think about God because their mind is so preoccupied with the gives and gets and the haves and the things that you can have in this world. Well, now, I've lived a while in this world, and I can tell you that you uh, that's your goal, uh, to have all the money that you can have, to have the highest occupation that you can have, uh, to be uh, one that is uh, well off, with, so to speak. I can tell you you'll never be satisfied with that. Now, you may get well off by other people's standards, but you'll never be satisfied with it. Uh, you may get the job where you supervise not only tens and not only twenties, but even hundreds of people. That'll never be enough to satisfy you with it. In fact, you'll learn what Solomon learned a long time ago. It's vexation and vanity of the spirit. But if you set your mind to be all you can be in God's service, it will have a reward for it, and it will have, uh, be a rewarding life for you that nothing else can take care of. And so whenever we stop and see that, we see that Joshua was like that. Jesus said once, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. That's a proven fact. The Lord said it, and he never lied. You cannot serve God and mammon, Matthew 6 and 24. We need men like Joshua today. And we need them to start preparing today to be ready for the future. Well, the next thing that Joshua uh, said and the commitment that he made, he said, as for me and my house, as for my house, we will serve God. You know, uh, whenever I uh, stop and think about the condition of the world today, I do have to recognize that this is something that I believe is different uh, than it has been in past, gener past generations. Uh, and that is, uh, I see today in too many places a lack of parenting and a lack of children that honor uh, and respect their parents. Now, I've just spent 25 years in the public school system. Marcus is getting close to that. My wife spent 25 years in the school system. And here's what I noticed that just appalled me. You would have a meeting with parents, and they'd say, we don't know what to do. We can't do anything with him. He just does what he wants to, and he doesn't pay us one bit of attention. Well, I'll tell you, that may be the way it was at your house, but at my house, you did pay some attention. If you didn't, you had some attention brought to you, and you'd pay attention the next time. And uh, But today, it seems like we've gotten past all that. And uh, really, it only accounts to me as being a, a, a sign and a symptom of laziness. Parents don't want to discipline their children. They don't want to be involved in their children's life. And that's true in the school system. That's true outside the school system in the neighborhoods. And that's true in the church sometimes, too. You know, whenever we stop and think about your greatest responsibility on earth, it could be something else. It could have been to be a great evangelist. It could have been perhaps to be uh, uh, someone that was uh, in business and you could uh, perhaps help other people through your business. 
But whenever you decided to be a father, whenever you decided to be a mother, your main interest by God's own measures and standards shifted to be rearing and raising your children in the nurture and admonition of God's way. And if you're not doing that, you are falling slack and you're falling behind in your duties to God. You know, whenever we think about that, uh, we stop and see that that is the sure sign of a degradation in society. I was reading another book this past week, and it was talking about what Gibbon, if you know who Gibbon is. I thought if I bought those little old books, there's about five of them about that thick. Well, I could read the whole set of New World Encyclopedias before I could read all of them, but I do like to look things up in them. And this man Gibbon was an ancient historian. He was a... Uh, he was an atheist. He didn't believe in God, but he tried to write the true history. And he said, what destroyed Rome, I want you to listen to this. He said, Rome was destroyed because the public leaders were ruling unfairly, unjustly, and only for themselves. We already talked a little bit about that. He said the whole city was totally given to athletics. Have you ever thought about that? Athletics. And that was the ruination, he says, of Rome. And he said that they were also uh, given to a divorce and remarriage. The degradation of the home did away with all of the foundations for society. And then the last thing he said was the, their religion deteriorated so that there were no, were no moral rights or wrongs. That everything could be done just like you wanted to and you'd find somebody to agree with it. Well, you know, that's pretty well describes our country today. And uh, sadly, it describes, it describes some of our homes today as well. Whenever we stop and see what's important in the home, is it not those things we're talking about right there? We have parents, and I, and I love sports, and I played sports. But we have parents today that are so dedicated to sports uh, that they get their children so involved in sports and they're so supportive of sports that the church falls behind. And that's just a sad fact of the matter. And whenever you stop and consider the truth of the matter, it is so, uh, the, the odds of your child ever going into professional sports is so minuscule that you would, uh, if you stopped and thought about that, you'd realize that it was a pretty good waste of time if that's your goal. And it shouldn't be your goal anyway because after high school, to be involved in sports means that you have to be apart from the Lord's church, whether it be in college or whether it be on the professional realm. But people today are so dedicated to sports, they'll miss gospel meetings for sports. They'll miss every service that they can on the count of sports, and they don't get any other benefit out of it except children who are not interested in the church. And so I tell you to be wary of that. Whenever we stop and talk about the degradation of the home, uh, and I don't know anything about anybody's home life here, very little about Marcus's home life, only because we talk more often. But I'll tell you what, I would be surprised if there wasn't somebody that you know in your family, maybe your extended family or whatever, uh, that has had problems in their marriage and in their home, and because of the degradation of their home, their children are suffering. Notice what Jesus said, and he said this because God has always placed responsibility uh, on the home for maintaining uh, the uh, standards and maintaining the uh, teaching of his word. Jesus said, whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery, and whosoever marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. Matthew 19 and 9, and Matthew chapter 5 and verse 32. But you know, uh, in my years in preaching the gospel, I have seen people make such mockeries of that and try to find so many ways around that that you wonder if they have any interest in the Bible at all. In fact, I heard of one fellow that uh, divorced his wife of many years, and he divorced her and married him a younger wife. And so after he was with her for a while, uh, she uh, died. And so he uh, came up with the idea, well, I'm not bound to anybody now. Uh, so I can marry whoever I want to. And so he had back to back there about three or four marriages and he came up with a new excuse every time. And so whenever you stop and think about that, he was no, and he was a church leader up until that time. But he was no more interested in being a good example. He was no more interested in the solidity of his home. He was no more interested in uh, doing what God wanted you to do than some stranger you find out on the streets. But you know, whenever we stop and uh, look at that, the degradation, no, let me revise that. The disintegration of our home 
marks the age in which we were born, and it also marks certain doom. In America, nearly the majority of children are reared in single-parent homes. Did you know that? You might not, because uh, unless you Eric or Marcus or myself or someone else that's involved in school, that might come as a surprise to you. But all you have to do is take a new class of students that you haven't seen before, that you don't know them, and you start calling the roll and asking them, you know, a little bit about themselves. Well, very few of them live with their biological mom and dad. Somebody else is raising them. Somebody else is left over the responsibility. And uh, these somebody else's are there just because that's all that's left. And uh, usually it's someone that's so old that uh, they uh, completely give out on raising children. And so those children end up doing what they want to do and growing up uh, without any supervision or love. And whenever we stop and think about that, there are more and more and more uh, that uh, if they are raised by two parents, then at least one, or sometimes both, usually both, are not their biological parents. And we live in a time whenever that is prevalent, people, and I wouldn't have believed that had I not seen the evidence of it myself. What's the remedy to that? Well, you can't remedy the world. I'll tell you that right now. You can't remedy uh, people that you don't have any influence over. But you can start at a very young age uh, teaching your children that and teaching them the responsibilities of marriage, teaching them the God's rules for marriage, and teaching them that God intends for one man to marry one woman and that be for life. And if you can instill that in them at an early enough age, uh, you will greatly enhance the probability that they won't make the mistake that's been made so many times over and over and over in history. Whenever you have that sin predominate in a congregation, it is the death knell for that congregation because whenever people uh, can't maintain their families, they can't maintain other things else. Remember that the Apostle Paul said that one of the qualifications for being an elder was a man that ruled over his household well. And then as if that weren't enough, he went on to explain it when he said, how can you possibly rule over the house of God if you can't rule over your own house? And you know, I've seen that happen. I've seen that happen where men who were well thought of just could not rule over their own house. And that's a shame. You know, whenever you stop and think about other things that uh, demoralize and destroy the church, they also destroy the families. They get the families first and then the church. That's the sexual promiscuity that takes place uh, in the society today. And it takes place in our schools. And it's amazing uh, what you see and hear in schools today uh, that is just commonplace. And, you know, that's something that is a shame and it's something that is a disease and a cancer and a canker on our society today. I never thought when I was growing up that you would see homosexuality celebrated and advertised and championed and defended of the way that you do today. Because whenever you talk and think about marriage, God said one man, one woman for life. And so whenever we stop and think about that, uh, uh, that uh, situation and uh, that uh, fornication that takes place in homosexual relationships, it's something that we scarcely would want to even talk about. And it's everywhere. It is a sin that will cost people their souls. Not a sickness that you can't avoid. Not a situation that because you were made the way you were made. But it is a sickness that will cost you your soul. It is a sin that will cost you your soul. Romans 1 verse 27. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 9 through 10. And listen, because we all want to go to heaven. We're here this evening because we want to go to heaven. And so we need to understand some of the criteria that go with that. The unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Uh-oh. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, drug addicts, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. You realize that? But those are some pretty common sins that we see every day. We try to see some of those. You know, he's always going to pinch a penny. You know what the Bible calls that? The covetous. Well, he'll do whatever he can to be able to uh, beat you out of the dollar. That's just the way he is. You have to watch it. That's called extortion. And whenever we see all of these sins that we've given prettier names to, Paul names them right here. And he says that you cannot go to heaven if you are involved in any of that. You know, the responsibility for maintaining your family 
is a God-given responsibility. And it's something that you can't shirk and come out on top of. Notice that uh, God, through Paul on this occasion, says uh, in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 8, that men, husbands, are to love their wives. Love your wives. You love your wife. I asked a fellow one time when I was younger. I noticed that he always, him and his wife always seemed to have a smile on their face. They always seemed to get along. And so I asked him, I said, you tell me what the secret to that is. I'd like to know the secret to that. It just seems to me like y'all are always happy with each other. And he said, well, I've always tried to treat my wife every day like I did before she married me. Have you ever thought about that? There's some things you'll say to your wife today that you've never said to her when you spoke to her. There's some things that you'd say to your wife today that you would have gotten mad if somebody else said to her. And there are some things today that you might even try to get by with that you would have never thought about before she said yes. And so we need to understand our responsibilities in that. Also a responsibility of the parents, the men especially, is to bring their children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 5. you do that? Or do you have an excuse why you don't have to? You ever sit down in the living room or at the kitchen table with an open Bible and talk to your children about what it says? Read to them and have them read to you what the Bible says? explain how that works and how that affects everyday life. Well, if you're doing what God said for you to do and you're bringing your, your children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, that's the only way to do it, to be a good example and to teach them the things that they need to know. And so today we need to dedicate ourselves to being <coughs> the overseers of our family like Joshua said he was. Wives are also to do that. Paul says in uh, Titus chapter 2 verse 4 through 5 teach the young women to be sober love their husbands, love their children to be discreet discreet you ever thought about that? what does it mean to be discreet? that means you hear something that's really not good news but you don't go tell it you're going to have more discretion than that, could that characterize your life? Because there's too many people that just want, as soon as they can, hear something bad. they got to make sure that everybody that's in their circuit of friends hears that too. But Paul says, teach the children to be discreet. Chaste. You know what that means? Do you sit down and talk to your girls, mamas, about chastity and being chaste? To love their children. To love their children. To be uh, obedient to their own husbands. That the word of God be not blasphemed. You ever seen a wife? It was more obedient to your husband than you ever thought you could be. Say, so, ah, I know what the Bible says. That's just not me. I can't do that. Have you ever seen a wife that was obedient to her husband that was talked bad about? Oh, she's held in high regard by everybody. And if she'll teach her children to do that too and accept their God-given place in life, they'll be held in high regard for everybody. So that's what Joshua's admonition was. As for me... In my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Well, he had one more thing that he had to say, and I want to cover that quickly. Uh, there he said that he was going to serve the God, serve God in truth. He says, now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve you the Lord. Joshua 24 and 14. You know, Joshua had some pretty hard and fast ideas on what it meant to serve the Lord. And notice he sort of said, in sincerity and truth. And the reason that Joshua made this statement is because he had witnessed firsthand what happens whenever you take your mind off God and begin to focus on other things in the world. Now, I'm not holding myself up by any stretch of imagination uh, as being the ideal parent or as being a model for a parent. But I will tell you some commitments that I made early in life that have borne fruit later in life. Uh, my son was playing on a baseball team. And back then, they don't do it so much now, but back then they never had a game on Wednesday because they knew that a lot of people went to church on Wednesday night. And so they never had a game. They played Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. And if they didn't make those games, they might do that on Saturday. Uh, but never on Wednesday, never on Sunday. And so uh, he had a couple of games rained out one year uh, when he was playing. And he wasn't, you know, 
know, he's paying a lot of gold just whenever those things really start to mean something to you. And he come home and he said, Daddy, they want us to play a makeup game on Wednesday, Wednesday afternoon. And I said, well, you know how we feel about that. I know, but they, they really want me to go. I said, well, I'll tell you what. I'm going to let you get started at something like 4, 30, 5 o'clock. I said, I'm going to let you go down there. I'm going to let you be in that ball pit. But when I pull up in this old yellow truck out here, I don't want to have to blow the horn, and I don't want to have to get out of the truck and come and get you. When you see me pull up, you come to the truck because we're going to church. Okay. So whenever it got about uh, 6.30 or so, maybe a little bit after, I went down there in my old yellow truck, and I pulled up in the parking lot, and I could see him way out, and he looked up and saw me. And he started to get up, and he sat back down. And then he, he sat back down again, and I thought, now, this is not right. And I got out and walked up through there, and I realized what had happened then. Uh, when I got up to where the other parents and the coaches could holler at me, they said, Terry, Terry, don't take him out. Don't take him out. We'll have to forfeit if you take him out. We don't have but eight other people here. I said, I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry that uh, all this had to go down. But y'all know where we stand. And we got up and left. And uh, when we did that, I don't know if it impressed anybody else. I don't know if they thought any more of the church. It's not likely they did. And I don't believe they thought any more of me. Probably they thought less. But I'll tell you who it did impress. It impressed my boy. And it's a model that he still carries today. We don't miss church for things like that. And so whenever you talk about serving God and truth and spirit and sincerity, it's not just a game we play. It's not just something that we hit a lick at and go on. It is being uh, absolutely sure of what to do, absolutely sure of when to do it, and making sure that we never neglect our service. You know, whenever we stop and think about that, if we don't do those things, and if we don't revisit those <coughs> ideas, the moral fabric of our congregations, of our families, and society is already gone. But the moral fabric of our congregations, of the Church of Christ, and our families are in for some hard times. We need to know what God would have us to do, and we need to dedicate ourselves to doing that like we never have before. You know, one thing that you never hear taught about in other places is the gospel plan of salvation. It's plain, and it's simple, and I want to go over that with you this evening just in case there's one here who might have questions about that. What do I need to do to be saved? It's the greatest question you could ever ask, and it'll, you need to have the truth on that and have the right answer for it. If I want to be saved, and I am a sinner, and I've not ever made any attempt to be saved, what do I need to do? Well, first I have to hear the Word of God taught. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, there the apostle writes, Without faith it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You have to repent of your sins. Jesus, the very Savior, the Son of God, says in Luke chapter 13, verse 3, Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. You have to confess Jesus is the Son of God. In Matthew 10, and verse 32, Jesus said, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. And you want that. Now you want that. And he says also, if you fail to confess me before men, I'll not confess you before my Father, which is in heaven. And then you must be baptized for the remission of your sins. Jesus himself again said in uh, Mark chapter 16, verse 15 and 16, he said, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. You know what that word damned means? eternally cursed from God's presence and all that is good and holy. You don't want that. And so this evening, if you've not obeyed the gospel, we're going to sing this song. It's been put into the service here just to give you that opportunity uh, to give you a time to respond to the gospel. If you're here and you have obeyed the gospel and you don't have sin in your life that you want to take care of, that you need to take care of, uh, we will assist you in that also while we stand in the sun. Yeah. 